it is uh, always a pleasure for me uh, to look again at the Roman pottery manufacturing site in Highgate Wood. Um, and what I'm going to do tonight is try and concentrate on two wider questions that relate to it. The first one is, is really whether, rather than standing alone, it was but one of a number of similar sites in the clay woodlands of northwest London. And secondly, I want to see whether the production of the pottery, or at least inquire as to whether the production of the pottery there should be seen really as a sort of byproduct of large scale woodland management organized by the office of the Imperial Procurator in Britain, which was established in London. So they're the two things I shall be sort of trying to juggle and I hope uh, to at least say enough to get you asking a few questions when we, when we get to the end of my bit of the evening. Well, the first slide which you can see uh, shows the location of the site uh, in relation um, to Roman London. It's uh, about four and a half to five miles north or more precisely north, north, north west of the city. Uh, it's sited in a way which is almost equidistant between the routes of two major highways to the north, Watling Street on the left, going up, of course, via uh, Broccoli Hill uh, to Verulamium, and then heading up towards the northwest. And secondly, uh, Ermine Street, uh, just, uh, just to the western side of the River Lee, uh, and continuing to the north through Lincoln and on towards York and beyond. So there are two major highways and Highgate sits more or less in the middle of them. Um, early uh, reconstruction maps. I'm just going to try and... Sorry, let's just start with that one first. Um, the site um, was actually found by Tony Brown uh, in 1962, when he was doing a, a, a survey uh, of Roman sites in, well, sorry, a survey really of, of any sorts of site, particularly prehistoric ones uh, that uh, might uh, occur uh, in the area. And he found these very fragmentary shirts, well worn, one of which there is quite clearly of a type called the poppy beaker which I'll come back to this evening. But they were there, they were lying under the trees in the northern end of the wood. Um, earlier reconstruction maps, uh, essentially going back to the days of Wheeler, uh, obviously a huge, huge figure in bringing forth the study of Roman London and produced for his Roman London volume of 1928, gave some indication of the topography of the Roman London area and also the likely extent of the woodland. There's a, there's a map to show the river systems and you can see the two roads I was just talking about, uh, Watling Street here, uh, Ermine Street going up along the side of the valley. Highgate or Highgate Wood site is sitting about here where I'm pointing to at the moment on high ground and with discernible rivers running off uh, down easterly towards the River Lee itself, a major entry point for London. Um, and this other map, the more topographic one, shows the likely extent of the woodland. Uh, essentially, a lot of the land is clay, a lot of it is shown as heavily wooded, where there are gravel outcrops it's shown as possibly being lighter wooded, but a lot of the northern part of London, particularly, well, both, both to the west and once you're across the Lee in what we now know as of Epping Forest, that is seen as being very densely and heavily wooded. Uh, there's also quite extensive areas to the south of the river, in, including what these days is known as the Great North Wood, uh, which runs back uh, from the slightly higher ground, a few miles south of the city, uh, all the way down towards Croydon. So there do appear to be substantial 
woodlands there. I'd like to move on now to show you two slides, uh, which again, I think focus on what I want to say tonight. Um, this one shows what is usually referred to, and, and many of you who have worked on Roman sites will know as a poppy beaker. It's one of the most diagnostic vessel types produced in Highgate Wood. And this particular one, or at least the portrait of it there, the photograph of it, was sent to me last autumn out of the blue. Uh, apparently, it had been found during an excavation uh, in the city's Lombard Street area in the 1980s and sold off. Um, it had been de described as Highgate Seaware, uh, a reference to how we'd classified the fabric of this type of vessel in Highgate Wood. Uh, in maybe just a couple of years ago, it had been sold on to its current owner, and he was attracted to it because of its relationship to Highgate Wood close to where he lived. Uh, and, and in responding to the new owner's photograph and request for information, I did have to tell him uh, that, though of course it may have been made in Highgate Wood, that there was a possibility that it was been made elsewhere on a site that as yet was unknown. I'll return to this pot as we go on later this evening. The second uh, picture, again with reference to what we'll be looking at tonight, is, uh, is a writing tablet found close to the city's Walbrook uh, in an excavation in the mid 1990s. Uh, I, won't, I won't point very much about it uh, to you tonight, but I will say that uh, it refers to a slave, a slave called Vegetus and refers to that slave purchasing a girl called Fortunata for 600 denarii. The Vegetus is described as a slave of Montanus, and Montanus himself is described as a slave of the emperor. Uh, Vegetus was paying a sizable sum to purchase Fortunata, equivalent to two years gross pay for a legionary soldier. So we've got three categories of slave in ascending order revealed uh, in that tablet. And Tomlin, who studied the tablet, points out that imperial slaves like Montanus are likely to be staff seconded to the imperial procurator's office in the provinces where these imperial procurators served. In fact, uh, ranks of imperial freedmen, as well as imperial slaves, together with soldiers, were likely to form the staff of the procurator of the emperor in military provinces such as Britain. And I think that fortunate discovery of the writing tablet throws some light on one there. And I just want to make the point that the actual or potential wealth and status of imperial freedmen, i.e. freed imperial slaves, which might happen sometime during the slave's career. I just want to point out that the money that they may have should not be underestimated, uh, nor their status. There is at least one papyrus I'm aware of from the Fayum in Egypt, which records various freed imperial slaves, now freed, freed men, as owners of estates. And I think a number of them might be expected in London uh, and might be serving the procurator's office. Now I'll return to his office and its economic activity soon, but we are aware that the office has been established in London by about AD 60, if not before. Uh, there's a, I'm afraid this section of wall, fine as it is, found it, I think in the early 1880s, uh, during the discovery of what today we call the district line, very close to Tower Hill. Unfortunately, it didn't survive, but we're looking from outside the city. We can just see the basically the base stone of, of the wall here. We can say uh, layers of the, of the surface together with a tile, of course, and more layers higher up. Unfortunately, that bit of wall didn't survive the building of the railway. However, the bit next to it, just uh, south of it, did, 
Many of you will have seen this, of course, it's on Tower Hill, and just, just, just to the um, more or less immediate southwest of the station. And behind the wall on the external side, uh, in a bastion, which is an external tower added to the wall, not necessarily in the Roman period, could be beyond, uh, was a part of a tombstone of uh, an officer called Julius Classicianus. And we know from literature, particularly from Tacitus, that Classicianus was the procurator in Britain, sent there by the emperor in the immediate aftermath of the Boudican rebellion. Uh, as I say, it was the, the, the remains were found essentially dumped within a bastion there. There they are, part of the, part of the tombstones that were discovered. Uh, and uh, essentially uh, that does demonstrate that the procurator is serving in London very soon after the end of the Brudigan uprising, and indeed may well have been established earlier on in the, in the uh, 17 years or so between the invasion and that insurrection. There's a reconstruction of the tombstone um, and essentially uh, it refers to a later part of the tomb, which was found actually in the 1930s when more of the bastion was disturbed, but it actually uh, does, um, does produce evidence that he was the procurator of the province of Britain. So the procurator's office, very important one, very substantial, uh, is established in Britain, in London, very early on. Okay, I'll come back to him uh, and to the procurator's office later on. Let me now move to the Highgate Wood site itself. I'll say a little bit about it and show you some slides. Uh, we're looking at a slide of the wood now. You can see some coppiced hornbeam trees on a slope to the north. Highgate Wood covers some 70 acres. Many of you, I'm sure, will know it. It's on relatively high ground. It runs between Highgate and Muswell Hill. Um, and the production site was found, those sherds I showed you earlier on, found by Tony Brown when he was undertaking his field survey on open ground there in the early 60s. Now the wood itself is a surviving fragment of the Bishop of London's hunting park, part of his vast woodland holdings in Northwest London. It's dominated by oak and hornbeam even today, and it was saved from destruction in the early 1880s because protests were directed against cutting it down and the land being sold off by the church commissioners and developed for housing. And the protests, fortunately, uh, led to the wood being taken over by the Corporation of London and open as a public space. And so it remains today, some 100 and what, whatever it is, 130 years, 140 years after it was open to the public. Uh, in 1966, Tony and I uh, undertook a trial excavation near where the pottery had been found and um, essentially uh, the fragments um, of ceramic vessels were found very early on to likely to be, have been the results of pottery production on the site. Of course, quite a lot of surprise as you uh, can imagine. But I'll show you some slides now, both of the excavations and of the pottery and of some experiment work before I continue. Um, it was an extensive amount of work that was done over several successive summer seasons. Um, it was la very largely a a voluntary project, so um, there was always an educational element to it, and it always gave a lot of people opportunities to experience archaeology. Uh, we're, we're looking essentially more or less to the north, in the northern end of the wood, and you can see the trenches actually numbered and laid out in the ground. There's still some indications that activity might have carried on further to the north of where a railway had been cut through there in the 19th century, um, but the major extent of the site really lay in this area here to the south. These uh, darker 
linear features are the remains of park paths that had been laid out probably again in the 1880s when the site was first opened. Certainly went right over the top of the kilns and into the pottery dumps without any indications that anyone found or recognized or was interested in anything which might have been there. Um, so if we look at trenches, uh, there are various things that we can see in them. There are at least two major rubbish dumps, one up here, and I'll show you kiln eight in a moment. Another one down here, which was much more extensive, in which there are a number of kilns found, and I'll indicate those two. And ditch systems running down the ridge and running down the ridge as it dropped to the south and also dropped to the north as well. And another ditch system just a little bit further uh, to the east up here. So fairly extensive, excavated in summer seasons, principally between, uh, you know, in terms of long seasons between 1967 and 1973-4. Not all the features were necessarily Roman, and I just want to start with these wheel ruts along here. When we first found them, you can just see them below the ground surface. You can just see this darker stain, I'm sure. They were linear. Uh, we thought maybe we found actual evidence of Roman buildings here. There were plenty of Roman sherds in them. Um, but as we excavated, they continued along uh, without <laughs> showing any signs of, uh, of um, declining. And um, usually, well, very much at the, the same distance from each other. And it became pretty clear that actually what we found were wheel ruts belonging to um, the essentially the removal of gravel from further to the west. The wood got renamed Gravel Pit Wood in the late 18th, early 19th century, and a lot of gravel was extracted. We found the cartwheels, and that was pretty clear when we started getting late 18th, early 19th century material in them. So you have to be very careful that all the features you're looking at can be relatively securely dated. And these were certainly not Roman. That's uh, looking at some of them uh, when we actually sectioned through them. But there were genuine Roman features which very much dominated. And they included ditch systems, which seem to have been dug probably for clay management uh, in, in, in actually producing water and, and preparing clay uh, that might be used in the making of pottery. Um, and kilns, as many of you will, I'm sure, be aware uh, of Roman kilns and what they are, but, but essentially um, the features of them usually include a furnace, some sort of pedestal which served, uh, if you put bars across it, uh, to be a base on which you could stack pottery for firing, a flue running along, and then an area where the fire was created and, and could be led into the flue. And above, and these are the more difficult parts, are the ovens, uh, which may have had permanent or may have had temporary structure, more likely the latter, I would suggest. So we were looking for features which might indicate that kilns were present on the site. And we certainly found evidence of them. The earliest of the kilns uh, were built into ditches, and they were looking at one, uh, which had a through draft coming in one side and then going out the other. Most were orientated northeast, southwest, more or less related to the most likely prominent wind direction and some fragments of pottery which made in that sort of kiln. Others were built up from a ground surface, which may itself have been slightly lower than the real surface. This kiln here, you can see a big round pedestal here. You can see the walls of the oven, fragments of them coming around here. You can even see the fittings where fire bar it still survived, and the fire bar didn't survive, but the fittings did. And you can imagine a lot of bars crossing here from the outside walls of the pedestal, and the pottery firing would be stacked above. Uh, there'd be a stoke hole up here, and the flue area would be here. But it survived reasonably untacked in this in this more or less undisturbed uh, area of woodland. And there's a plan of it. See the pedestal and the walls around the furnace and the stoking area here. 
And then more bigger kilns, more impressive actually. This one here, we're looking from the stoking along the stoke, oh, there's still some of the capping there. You can see inside the furnace here, you can see the pedestal. And these times the, the bars up here, more or less to be just fashioned clay, which is cut through. That's looking at it from the Northwest. So you could imagine the uh, furnaces down below and the oven would have been from here up with the pottery stacked, presumably here during firings. That's a that's a, another kiln. That's the actually the, the likely to be the latest kiln that was built on the site, uh, very close to the surface, the ground surface. Park path there, you can see the gravel ran directly across the surviving top of it. And this kiln also had a tiled flue. That was um, that was the only kiln on site that was built in that way. And. Essentially, once you've gone into the area where pottery had been made, where kilns had been dismantled, where waste of pottery had been dropped or just stacked up or left, um, you could see the earth was extremely dark. Uh, and there's one of the site supervisors there, um, only an inch or so below the current ground surface. And you can see already loads of fragments of pottery being dug up amongst the roots uh, and put into the fine tray. And of course, one of the jobs was to try and work out essentially from these fragments um, what we could work out uh, about the forms, the shapes of the pottery, and then what we could work out about the fabrics, the constituents of the clay. And these were worked on over a number of years by groups of us. Um, at the City Literary Institute. A number of students there looking at, obviously, a whole range of pots, including vessel fragments. Um, and of course, much of the material was fragmentary. Um, and from better surviving pots, we could, we could tell some of the types. So you had uh, gray ware bowls, such as this, um, well-made, well-fashioned in a sort of sandy clay. Um, uh, two jars, fairly typical of production on the site, both waste of vessels, you can probably see here the, the rather misshapen uh, reconstructed rim, and that's not, not just carelessness on our part as we reconstruct it, it's obviously a pot that had suffered. And the, the, it's an iron rich clay in Highgate, so if you fire it in reducing circumstances, it will go grey, and what's been added to a number of these vessels a white slip, which you can see here on both of them. Uh, so that slip is, is basically iron free and it will remain that colour in firing, irrespective of whether you reduce or oxidize. There's another vessel, again, you can see the slip, it's rather square, and there's a separation on the rim, oh, sorry, on the, on the shoulder uh, between the neck and the neck. Uh, I'm sorry, Harvey. There's um, some interference on sound at the moment. Someone's, someone's got their microphone on. So, um, okay. Oh, that's better. That's all right. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's it. Okay. So there's a there is an example of one of Harvey Beaker also some waste them put together again with white slips and the Harvey Beakers are decorated with barbecue dots, which are probably applied with a comb. Uh, in firing, uh, the clay will reduce fire properly um, but the slip will remain white so they're very decorative vessels most of them are very much this shape but you do get a range and that's an example of one with a very different uh, neck of, of the poppy beaker types so again what the students uh, were doing really was searching through the pottery working out the shapes uh, and trying to classify it and we were I think um, sorry, I've got, I can't, can everybody see the end of it? I can see other people in my end, but I think you, you'll be able to see it. We were able to work out, I think, essentially from the pottery that there were three fabrics. One was a, a vegetable timber, uh, probably representing a very early phase. B is a sort of grog timber, where so that, that clay is there tempered with broken up bits of clay already fired, 
and C, which is a sandy fabric, which looks as though it's been some sand that's been introduced to the clay while you're making it. And uh, we could work out that there seemed to be a number of production phases. The kilns were different, the pottery was different, and they basically, the structures of both seem to get improved through time. And we thought that we could probably trace um, uh, a usage of the site uh, between very soon after the conquest, all these dates are very circa anyway, and sometime towards the middle of the second century on conventional dating of Roman pottery. So we, we thought we could recognize about four phases of time. And we thought we could recognize five major shapes, one being jar forms, another being beakers, third being what we call uh, a bead rim jars, and the two others being essentially dishes or bowls, according to how they appear on the classification. One sort had lid grooves, which suggested that lids were produced for them, and indeed numbers of lids were found on the site, and others uh, were uh, without lid grooves, and presumably without lids. And they seem to form the majority, the vast majority of pottery uh, featured those types. We also did experimental work on the site a number of years. The biggest experiment was done during 1971, when we endeavored with the help of the Horniman Museum uh, to run our courses for teachers of pottery and teachers of history, uh, which involved making pottery, uh, building kilns, and firing, uh, firing the former in the latter. And that took place over uh, a, a very good fortnight of weather in, uh, in June, late June, July. Um, 1971. Uh, and there's one of the students, Potter's teacher, uh, George, uh, in the process of just finishing throwing a, a, a jar imitating uh, a classic Highgate form. Uh, when we made the pottery and we, we made these sort of dishes and we made the jars, and we made the poppy head beakers, they were let out to dry. Uh, during the days uh, in the woods. I say the weather, fortunately, was very clement, so they, they did dry in the period uh, before firing. Um, we also built kilns. There's Andy Appleby, one of the tutors, building, um, building one of these kilns. We tried again to, to recreate how uh, the Roman kilns there, or at least how the bigger Roman kilns uh, might have looked. Uh, he's now building a basically a dome making use of these timbers. Uh, there was some evidence from burnt clay that wood was, uh, there were timbers in the higher parts of these kilns. Uh, and then we fired them, uh, recording the temperatures uh, uh, as the firings progressed. Um, and then we uh, took the pottery out of the kilns after the firing. And it, a major number of possible, all the pottery was, I mean, all the clay was dug up on the wood. It was sort of kneaded together uh, before the potters got their hand on it. They then threw them on kit wheels, uh, but they were soon able to make very good pottery and we were able to fire it. We did everything reasonably well, where we, our major failure here was that we were producing reddish pottery rather than gray pottery. And that's because we didn't uh, have enough expertise uh, to be able to reduce clays in, in the way that clearly had happened in the Roman period. Um, a few factors emerged from the study of the site, which we need to bear in mind when we characterize it. Um, firstly, production, as I said, appears to begin close to the time of the Roman conquest, let's assume in the 40s or early 50s, and continue into the middle years of the second century, maybe the 140s, 150s, 160s. So we've got a production period of about 100 years or more, which at least signifies that a number of generations of potters would have been involved in the manufacture. Secondly, there's a lack of evidence from finds and features for activities unrelated to the process of 
uh, pottery making. So perhaps the potters were itinerant, using the woodland resources to make pottery and build kilns, but coming from somewhere else, maybe of some distance, to actually do that work. And the third point is that in the findings uh, that we made, was that despite this century or more of pottery production, it does seem to have taken place episodically rather than constantly, uh, perhaps with intervals between episodes of a decade or maybe more. And that finding at least prompts us to ask whether this was the only site where vessels now categorized as high gateway pottery, such as the Lombard Street vessel that I showed you earlier and is up again there now, were made. And perhaps it also asks another question too. Um, was a, the pottery production itself an indicator of something bigger? Was it a subsidiary offshoot of a more extensive operation taking place within the woodland landscape of Northwest London, which had fortunately survived perhaps because the wood itself had survived or this aspect, this part of the wood had survived. Uh, on the assumption that the land in the environs of Londinium came under the control of Londinium itself, uh, we would ask therefore, were the natural resources that the land provided exploited for the benefit of Londinium itself? Uh, and if it was, one of the most important of these resources would have been the timber that was available in Northwest London. Now, I think, now I want to go back to the Imperial Procurator in London and the role of his office. Now, the Procurator essentially is uh, the Emperor's personally appointed chief financial supplies officer in the province. As I mentioned earlier, the first procurator that we have physical evidence for in London is Julius Classicianus. Um, that comes from the various fragments of his tombstone that survived. There's a reconstruction of the tomb. Uh, there are various reconstructions and it's clearly different on others, but the, the Initial finding in the mid 19th century gave his name. The discovery in the early 1930s showed that he was the procurator of the province of Britannia. Uh, and the tomb was erected by his grieving wife, Julia Indus. Um, so essentially, we, we have him there, we have him buried there. And at some stage, his tomb seems to have been dismantled and chucked, or parts of it chucked, uh, within this bastion. It's not, it's not unusual to have the bastions around the city wall full of material associated uh, with Rome itself. Um, leaving, oh, I'll just show you one more procurator. Sorry, this is not, this is one that uh, I came across um, in Trier. Uh, and if you look at the third line down, described as the procurator of the province. Actually, he's not of the province, it's of various provinces. He's, he's a procurator of the province of Gallia Belgica and, and also of the German, the two German provinces on the frontier. Uh, and basically this is a career list underneath that, um, or at least a career list so far, depending on the nature of the uh, inscription. But I did notice with great interest that one of his earlier uh, duties. All these are usually two, three year appointments which you travel through on your way to the, the top if you're fortunate that he was uh, the prefect, the officer in charge of uh, a cavalry regiment coming from Britain. A, a regiment. There are many regiments of Britain uh, raised by Rome uh, and they were not stationed in Britain, they were stationed usually along the Rhine or the Danube but he'd had a, he'd had he had contact with that, and now he was a very big figure indeed. So just coming back, leaving that, let, let's get back to uh, uh, the archaeological evidence for the activities of the pro procurator's 
of it at the local level. And the fines include writing tablets. Uh, you can see one to the top of that screen, as well as numerous stamp tiles. Uh, these tiles associate the office of the procurator of the province uh, with construction. They're from building. Uh, and presumably, uh, not just the building, but the repair, maybe the extension of public building complexes through time. Um, though they're largely confined to Londonium, um, it was very interesting for me when I was taking part in an excavation on the Greenwich Temple in uh, 1999 in Greenwich Park, that a, a, a fragment of one of these building times, tiles turned up. There it is, in just there, along with an inscription. Uh, and you might be able to see the PP there and just the Britannia there. If you look at the being put together, Procurator of the Province Britannia, Lon. And the N is done in a slightly funny way, which uh, suggests it may be a combination of an N and A, which might indeed, if it's right, give an early example of Londinium referred to as Londinium Augusta, which would be very nice if it was. Um, Now, again, let's, let's look at uh, the evidence that might be associated uh, with the procurator's office. Um, many of the buildings in Londinium, public or private, would require timber, which points to the possibility that the procurator's office controlled the resource, the timber resource, through a combination of, I would think, of managed woodland and ancient wildwood. This is a rare example of a of a surviving timber building. It comes from very low lying clay, silts and peats, quite waterlogged in Southwark, off the main area of settlement, close to a channel of the Thames. It's an oak building which Dendro suggests was put up in the mid years of the second century, but you can see a lot of the oak floor surviving very well. A little, uh, presumably an entrance coming down here and even bits of the walling surviving too. So it's, it, you know, often wood is absent from a, a lot of these sites because it just doesn't survive the situation, but wood would be, could be used not only in, for, simply for timber buildings, but in, in, in more extensive stone built complexes as well. Uh, it could also be uh, used for the building of waterfronts. That's a picture of Dunning, one of the uh, observers that were employed. Uh, through Wheeler's um, acts in the 1930s to observe building sites uh, as they took place. That's from Regis House, quite close to London Bridge, in their rebuilding of it in the early 1930s. And there's a lot of huge timbers that came up. In the mid 90s, the site was redeveloped again, and a lot more of these timbers were found in situ. And they, they're basically parts of the one of the earlier waterfronts uh, and riverside defences of Roman London. They're very extensive timber. Some would require a lot of uh, a lot of big wood uh, to, to to put them in. So use for wood uh, for, for frontiers. There's some slight, some rather fr more fragile ones from Southwark on a channel of the Thames, uh, just in the grounds of Guy's Hospital. That was found in the 89, 1990. You're looking out of the channel now towards the revetment and drier, but not very, not very good land uh, just beyond it uh, to the west. There's another view of it there. So you need a lot of, in Southwark, you need a lot of buildings to basically to maintain the islands from being washed away by not only the Thames, but the subsidiary rivers which are running in and from it, uh, but also to tie up boats as well. Um, and also boats. And uh, uh, one of London's famous four boats uh, was found uh, when County Hall was about to be built uh, just before the First World War, looking down on County Hall from the wheel. Um, but right in the back of it, when the construction was going on, uh, uh, an extensive seagoing vessel remains of were actually found uh, and they, they, a great, great effort was made to save those and they became part of the display 
of, of the new London Museum, which was just going to be established uh, in, in, in Kensington. Um, and that looks to be a part of a sea going ship. And again, extensive timbering uh, would be needed for that. Not a brilliant slide, that one, but that's Marsden's Blackfriars boat, which was found, I think, in 1969. I remember going over to look at it from Blackfriars Bridge, and that was found buried in the river um, uh, then when, when work was being done, or else where the fleet was running down to the Thames. But you need wood for a, a lot of purposes. I mean, not only the, the buildings and the water fronts and other port installations, but you need it for carriages and carts, for furniture, tools, other utensils, not to mention coffins. And additionally, it would be in constant demand uh, for heating, uh, for bathing and, 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 and for cooking. Um, I was, I would just add that um, I was looking recently at, at this, it's, it's not a subject I'm hugely aware of, but um, a recent article by Italian archaeologists concentrating on work on the Mediterranean concluded that from their studies uh, around the empire and from what, what, what writers suggested, that really um, shipbuilding was considered to be the main cause of forest exploitation and also a major cause of programs of tree plantation or regeneration. Uh, statistics for the Roman period are in short supply, uh, but I was intrigued even more recently uh, by a claim that the building of um, French 74 gun uh, warships in the mid 18th century during the, the wars which involved us and the French uh, each required something like 3,000 mature oak trees to build. And um, apparently France built 50 of these 74-gun uh, ships in the 1780s alone. And again, that suggests that to do that, you'd actually have to destroy 150,000 mature oaks. So I wouldn't underestimate the needs of, of shipbuilding for timber. Uh, and of course, although we haven't any direct knowledge as yet, think of shipbuilding in London, and we do have a Classis Britannica, and we do have a number of boats around that have been found and investigated for good or for ill archaeologically. And quite clearly, there's a lot of river traffic, and I'm sure there's a huge amount of movement of goods along the Thames, both to the continent and back again, and probably up to the frontiers as well. So. I think uh, oak timbers anyway for ship building and repair are likely to be a major uh, uh, requirement uh, of those responsible. And the man responsible in the province for that, again, would be the emperor's procurator there. So if we assume that, uh, that there's a relatively constant demand for timber, uh, uh, in London, the development of a system allowing annual exploitation of woodland resources might be encouraged. And following coppicing, as if you've got managed woodland at an individual location, an interval allowing timber regrowth would be required prior to the next episode of coppicing. There have been various calculations and various types of timber. Some people talk about as little as three years, some seven, some 10, some many more. So. I would have thought that regular coppicing in the summers around London might occur. Um, my suggestion simply is that are the pottery making episodes in Highgate Wood linked to episodes of coppicing and perhaps some felling as well nearby. Now I just, like to make a couple of fairly concluding points uh, about uh, about this subject. Um, firstly, um, it seems to me more likely that the Highgate Wood production uh, stood alone. Oh, sorry, I should say first, is it more likely that the Highgate Wood production site stood alone, or was it one of many? Uh, by the 
early 1990s, it was being claimed that the high-grade industry, uh, and you can see the main forms of vessels again there, uh, was, and I quote, a significant supplier to London from the late first century through to the mid second century. It was even, I mean, statistically, as people worked on Roman pottery, it was even being claimed to be responsible for between 30 and 50% of the greyware assemblages that were being found in London. And these sorts of claims, particularly as we were beginning to think that actually this is all looking, you know, episodic and not very extensive. Uh, so the finding that we were having or concluding compared to what the pot specialists were having based on their work was a little bit uncomfortable. As I said, the excavation suggested in Highgate Wood no more than a dozen kilns. There was a limited quantity of waste of pottery and the production seemed to be episodic rather than continuous. So it seemed that if you were gonna have an answer to solve that problem, that it was much more likely that there were other similar sites existing somewhere in the woodland landscapes, perhaps operated by the same potters who were working at Highgate uh, and in use during other annual episodes of preparing timber for supply. And presumably if that is the case, these either await location or unfortunately have already been destroyed as urban development has spread through Northwest London. Uh, pioneering, um, so let's, I mean, that, that, you see, there's, a, there's a good example. That's, uh, that's from the, the, the book on the, on the uh, amphitheater. And it, I mean, the, the suggestion quite clearly is that these four pots made locally at Highgate, so undoubtedly they were found in the rectangular drain sump um, and leaving aside the question of what they were doing there, it, it is just accepted that these were actually made at Highgate. A bit like, you know, the guy who bought the poppy beaker from Lombard Street assumed it came from Highgate too. Um, well, I think that pioneering, as well as more recent uh, studies of the petrology, as well as the chemical analysis of the clays, ought to help us establish whether individual vessels that are attributed to Highgate or the Highgate industry uh, found on sites like the amphitheater or Lombard Street. Uh, we should, I think, find enough scientific evidence. There's a, that's a poppy beaker shirt. Sorry, you can see the dots, the white clay and the body. That's uh, the section done by the late Tony McKenna. There's the white slip running through. That's the dot up there, so it's much magnified. But it's possible that by the assemblages of the inclusions, the quartz, feldspar, shirt, or whatever it is in the clays, if then we can find uh, varieties of these in difference of these in vessels that are claimed to be from Highgate, presumably it is possible to say whether they are likely to be from there, or whether they're likely to be other sources, maybe in Northwest London or maybe beyond. But that, that I think is gonna be a future work to do. And my final point uh, is this. I'd like to see whether we can, can we get any clue as to who uh, the potters uh, were? Um, well, can we identify them uh, in any way? Well, I think we can if we can link the production to activities emanating from the procurator's office. It might help. I'm not sure that archer is going to help us. But um, a feature of many of the writing tablets found in recent years, um, principally from Vindolanda, but now quite a good quantity of them from Londinium and a few elsewhere. But uh, uh, um, a feature is the connection between soldiers and supply in terms of the language that survives. And within the ranks of legionary and auxiliary regiments, there are likely to be individuals whose specialist duties will include the manufacture of the tiles and the pottery 
that are required by their units or indeed other army units. So with the evidence that we now have um, both of serving as well as retired soldiers resident in London, it's worth asking whether they might have been contracted for a large scale annual program run by the operator's office in London um, and even a program to provide timber supplies for Londinium, including associated activities such as pottery production, making use of the waste wood uh, and the clay and water sources that might be available. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's the sort of area we might need to, to look for an answer as to who these potters through time, or many of them might have been. And finally, um, um, the one vessel that does seem to have quite a lot of continental links is the poppy beaker. Here's one I came across in Cologne, in the museum in Cologne. Uh, and poppy beakers are indeed found on a number of frontier sites close to the Rhine and to the upper Danube from the late first century on, onwards. So they're quite, they seem to be quite popular with soldiers and presumably whoever is associated with the soldiers uh, in those zones. And one doesn't wonder, at least, one can wonder at least as to whether these types spread to Britain as military units stationed on the Rhine or the Danube were from time to time redeployed here. So I think that finishes